Network Plus Series, Network Devices Part 1. Well, on the CompTIA Network Plus exam, there's an entire domain. It's actually Domain 3.0, which is entitled Network Devices. And Devices Part 1 and 2 are going to cover a big chunk of this particular domain. In this nugget, we're going to look at a wide variety of different types of networking devices. We'll look at hubs and repeaters, which are kind of legacy devices, but we still see wireless hubs out there. We'll look at network interface cards and network interfaces. Talk about different types of modems. We'll look at bridges and wireless access points. Talk about layer 2 and layer 3 switches. We'll look at the router, a very important device. If we have time, we'll look at the firewall or security appliance. I may actually save this for part two. It's really a specialty device. And then at the end here, we'll look at configuring a network device. I'll configure a Cisco 2811 integrated services router. I'll show you the command line interface and a graphical interface. Sound good? OK, let's take a look at network devices. A hub and a repeater, these are both physical, OSI physical layer one devices. And a hub is one of the first devices that basically took that original Ethernet bus and integrated it into a backplane so that you could configure a star topology. In other words, you could have a Ethernet hub as the center or the hub of a star hub and spoke topology and you could connect devices into it. We don't see hubs used very much anymore because they've been replaced almost entirely by switches, which are much more faster. You get full duplex communication, intelligent bridging, and all those great things in policy. But you will see a hub, for example, in a wireless environment. As we talked about in previous nuggets, the wireless access point is a hub, not an Ethernet hub, but an 802.11 hub. Now, also, you might see a repeater. Repeaters used to be used in wired environments in the sense that they could extend the limitations of the physical cable. So you could have repeaters every, I don't know, 100 meters, and you could extend the geography of your Ethernet, your shared Ethernet. Now, we typically see repeaters being used in wireless environments to help you kind of boost the bandwidth for nodes that are geographically farther away from the access point. So end stations that have to be farther away, you can use a repeater to kind of boost the signal. You'll also see repeaters that are, that are like devices that basically plug into a wall socket that can uh, repeat your 11B and 11G environment. So hubs and repeaters, these function at OSI physical layer one, and you typically see these nowadays in wireless environments. Uh, very rare to see them in wired environments. Now, that being said, just in case the CompTIA exam questions you, there are several types of hubs that are still out there that are used around the world, okay? And there's really four types. Uh, the passive hub, the passive hub is a basic physical layer one distribution device. It's also known as a concentrator. It may not even have a power source, even though most of the passive hubs do have a power source. They take incoming electrical signals on one port, they pass them down the cable or the internal bus to the other ports. So all the nodes see the signal just as if they were connected on a physical bus topology. An active hub will do more than simply rebroadcasting the incoming traffic. They can actually boost weak signals by retransmitting the data with proper transmission voltage and current. Active hubs can also be known as and referred to as a repeater. You see active hubs on 10 base T networks. They also have the ability to resynchronize data that's been received from a network interface card that we'll talk about here in a second, whose transmissions aren't within standard timing specifications. So they can provide other features as well. Now, a, another type of hub is called a switching hub. Now, a switching hub is an official term, okay? But a switching hub is really a layer two switch that we're going to talk about. Switching hubs buffer packets. They propagate packets as necessary. They can make changes in transmission speeds. They connect uh, 10 megabit per second and 100 megabit per second network interface cards to the same switched fabric. Another type of 
hub is called an intelligent hub and basically an intelligent hub means it runs some kind of policy on it. For example, it might support the simple network management protocol which allows you to gather intelligence and to do monitoring and reporting based on the traffic. Those are the four general categories of hubs. Again, uh, almost completely replaced by switches now except for the wireless realm. Now historically on Ethernets, you had BNC connectors and thin net adapters, but those have pretty much taken the place, even AUI connectors for thick net. But now we pretty much have RJ45 connectors and network interface cards. Now, when I say a network interface, this switch down here has a bunch of port density. Each one of these switch ports is a network interface in itself. And you can actually have cards that go into networking devices like routers and switches and multi-layer switches that provide network interface port density. But a network interface card is more often a end system interface. So you'll have a network interface card like a PCI, it goes in the PCI slot of a workstation or a PC. And this is a fast Ethernet network interface card. This is a fiber NIC. So you've got, you have interface cards for fiber connections, for FIDI connections, Ethernet connections, and again, these can be integrated into the laptop as well. All the new laptops are going to have integrated fast Ethernet ports built into them. And this is basically moving up from OSI layer 1, the physical layer, to data link layer 2. This is the network interface between the physical media, which in many cases is Ethernet, and layer 2 and layer 3. And these network interface cards, you can see here, will have little LEDs on them that can tell you things like, is data being transmitted? Is the network interface enabled and initialized? So we've got some indicators, not only on these network interface cards, but you'll also have indicators on the panels of switches and routers that can give you information as well. Now the word modem is derived from the phrase modulator, demodulator. And historically we have used these to convert or modulate the digital data from a computer into the analog signal that the public switch telephone network or POTS used. So we would use these dial-up modems for our 24K, 32K, 54K, 48K, whatever dial-up access. Now there are all different types of modem technology. There's a special type of modem for ISDN that's been used historically. You can see this is an external modem we have right here. It can be an external device that goes with your PC or your remote access server, or it could be integrated into the actual box itself, going into a PCI slot, for example. And we have modems for other technologies, like cable technology for broadband cable and broadband DSL that we talked about in a previous nugget. So DSL and cable, they also have their own types of modems as well. And you can see here's a Motorola modem. Now, modems haven't gone away, and they're still used, I'd say, about 15% of internet access is done through modems in North America. They're still widely used in other areas of the world. But the maximum transmission rate for your POTS circuits has been reached. The current standard, the V90, the V.90 standard, provides 56K of throughput, which actually exceeds your telephone line capacity. So you're typically going to get about 53 kilobit per second maximum. Also, POTS circuits can only handle a single session at a time. So if the line's busy, you can't use it to establish another connection for your data or voice. That's where ISDN becomes a bigger advantage. And by comparison, like here's a cap Motorola cable modem here. By comparison, a typical cable modem service will give you 1 to 10 megabit per second download speeds and possibly up to 2 megabit per second upload speeds. Even though we're seeing these bandwidths get higher and higher as this becomes a cheaper solution. So the modem, modulator, demodulator. I'm going to go ahead and combine the concept of a bridge with a wireless access point because wireless access points are the most common types of bridges that we see nowadays. Now by default, a bridge is different than a repeater or a hub because it has to actually read the MAC layer frames. 
So some bridges might be limited to linking similar MAC layer protocols, but typically bridges are used to bridge different protocols. For example, this is an old IBM bridge that bridges the 802.5 token ring to the 802.3 Ethernet. That's called a translating or encapsulating bridge. And what you see here, we use bridges either internally or externally to translate from a wireless environment. So here's a wireless bridge right here that could go on the outside of a building or even inside of a building. And the RF traffic comes to it and it goes to an Ethernet hub or a switch most likely, even a modular layer 3 switch and what happens is we're translating from 802.11 possibly 11b or 11g to 802.3 so we want to think about bridges now as moving from one protocol to another from one type of layer 2 encapsulation to a different type of layer 2 encapsulation and again the most common type of bridge we see nowadays is bridging wireless to a ethernet now a switch that we're going to look at here in a second actually is an assemblage of a bunch of bridges. So a switch actually does bridging. It creates these bridges between ports in the port density on the switch itself in the switch fabric or the switch backplane. So the concept of bridging is still there. Even a router will do a bridging because it can take information from on one interface and encapsulate it. For example, it could take information on the Ethernet interface, fast Ethernet on the inside of your organization, and it can translate it and it can reframe it with a bridging process to send it out a serial interface, maybe for a frame relay connection or an ATM connection. So the concept of bridging is still happening all the time. We just don't really have dedicated bridges anymore, except in the wireless environment, typically outdoors. The Layer 2 and Layer 3 switch has become really the backbone and the core device of modern local area networking for the small, medium-sized business all the way up to the enterprise. Now, like a bridge, a switch connects LAN segments. It uses a MAC address and a MAC address table to determine which segment we need to send the data to. However, switches operate at much higher speeds than bridges and they provide much greater functionality, advanced functionality. They provide, as you can see here in the diagram, higher port density. Okay, Compared to a bridge, a switch can have port density of 24 ports, uh, 48 ports. You can see this is an HP Pro Curve set of switches. Here are some uh, Cisco switches down here and they have much higher speeds. 10 megabit per second, fast Ethernet, and beyond. A large enterprise switch can have actually hundreds of ports. They also have really large frame buffers, so they can receive and process more frames than a bridge. Obviously, as I mentioned, they have faster port speed, and you're starting to see gigabit and 10 gigabit ports to allow more flexibility. You can also group ports together in what's called Ether Channel to get even greater bandwidth. And switches, layer 2 and layer 3, have fast internal switching. So their backplane, their processing, can do this very quickly. Most switches now use a process called store and forward. Let me, call, let me write that down. Store and forward. They actually store the entire frame, and they'll store it into a cache, and that way they can apply policy and processing to those frames stored in cache. They can also move information much quicker. Now a layer 2 switch is the most common switch that basically creates segments. We can use a VLAN. We talked about that. I can use VLANs on a layer 2 switch. I could place all of these in their own VLANs or broadcast domain. All of these in their own VLAN or broadcast domain. These and these. Now do they have to be adjacent to each other? No. I could take this port and these two ports and this port and this port and put them all in VLAN IT if I want to and create logical broadcast domains. Layer 2 switches can do that, but without a router you cannot route between those VLANs. In other words, routing is a layer 3 process, so we have to have a layer 3 process to move traffic between these VLANs and to other VLANs between switches. So we need a router, 
but a layer 3 switch actually has the routing process built into it. Now, that can be actually a routing module that's inserted into the actual switch, or it could be an RP, a route processor built into the particular model. So the layer 3 functionality, the routing functionality, can be a routing module where it can be internal route processing. So it provides layer 2 and layer 3 functionality. Now, you also hear the term multi-layer switch. I'll just put MLS here. A multi-layer switch is different than a layer 3 switch because it goes beyond just adding routing capabilities. A multi-layer switch can also do processing at transport layer 4 for TCP and UDP and it can provide additional policy and enhanced features for manipulating, managing, controlling, and applying quality of service to that traffic. The switch is an extremely important device in our network infrastructure. Let's move up the OSI model to layer 3 now and even layer 4 as we look at the router. And I'm going to give uh, another vendor their due here. Here's Juniper Networks with some Juniper Networks routers. I've shown you HP, HP Procurve. We've seen some Cisco devices. Now, again, you know what routing is. It's the process that forwards data packets between networks or subnetworks, also known as broadcast domains. And you do this using a layer 3 device, which is a router also known as a gateway. It's basically a gateway functioning at layer 3. Now, a router doesn't have to be a dedicated device. It could be a multi-homed workstation or server with multiple network interface cards on it and a route processor that routes packets between the network interfaces or network interface cards on that server. But the routing process, as you know, uses network routing tables, uses routing and routed protocols and algorithms to determine the most efficient path for forwarding IP packets. Router's primary function is to expand the scalability of networks beyond just the local area network by terminating layer 2 collision domains or segments and broadcast domains. Routers, like a switch, I'll have a CPU, has a motherboard, it has RAM memory, it has read-only memory. It's got a console port and networking ports, for example, serial ports and fast Ethernet and fiber ports on them. Routers have two main purposes path determination, finding the best path to move packets along a network, and packet forwarding. Now one thing about routers is this, they're becoming much more intelligent, much more integrated and converged. They're providing a lot more features than just simply path determination and path forwarding. A little bit later on, we're going to look at a graphical user interface of a 2811 Cisco router. And when you see that interface, you'll see the increased functionality that a router has now. It can do network address translation. It can provide DHCP services and DNS services. It can be a VPN virtual private network concentrator. You can apply quality of service policy and many other actions on these integrated service routers. Again, the router actually functions at layer 2 because it does do bridging and switching. It operates at layer 3 because it deals primarily with the IP protocol for our purposes, although routers can typically route Apple Talk and IPX SPX, as well as the ISIS protocol and Internet protocol. And it also has layer 4 intelligence as it can process transport layer TCP and UDP processing as well. What do you say we do a little bit of a configuration of our network devices? Right now I'm using my console port on an access server, a Cisco access server, which really looks like a router. It is a router. I'm using a rollover cable coming from a serial port on this management station. And I can show, I can use the show command. And again, when we look at the command line interface of these different devices. Most of them are Unix based. So it, it's a lot like working in, let's say, an old Windows NT system at the command prompt or working in a Unix or a, a Linux console. So I'm going to do a show hosts. And I can see all the different hosts that this access server can access. Uh, I've got a 2800 ISR router. I've got a 3600 series backbone router. I've got a 2611 XM, two of those 
routers as well a frame relay switch which is really just a, another router that is configured to do frame relay switching I've got a switch a 24 port layer 2 switch I've got a firewall PIX firewall appliance and a uh, Cisco adaptive security appliance if I wanted to access this 2800 ISR I would just type in at the prompt here the host name and it'll connect to it using a reverse telnet connection and then it asks me for some credentials so let's go ahead and type those in there and I'm at the let's just stop here at this what we call the enable prompt if you want to see what commands you can run just put a question mark in here it will show you the commands that you can do with this exec prompt EXEC this exec prompt and again a lot of things we can do we can connect we can do security commands we can go up to the privilege prompt by typing in enable we can log on hit the space bar here and you can just see all the other commands I can do a lot of show commands I can also issue here for example show do a question mark and you can see I can show a bunch of stuff and this is just uh, seeing the configuration and showing information about these different areas of this router this is a particularly robust router with a lot of features, a lot of capabilities to it. Of course, m many of this, this is all beyond the scope of your network plus, but again, if I type in enable, it gets me to, and it asks me for another password here, it gets me to the what's called the privileged prompt where I have more privileged commands I can run. Like I can set the clock on this router, for example, I can do security commands. I can do some debugging functions or troubleshooting functions. If I want to configure, and I'll just type in configure. Or, by the way, I can use the tab key. If I just type in CONF and hit the tab key, it auto completes it for me. I can configure several things here. Uh, I'm going to configure, not, not the memory, I'm going to configure the terminal. And I'm configuring the terminal now by accessing it through the console, which is what I'm doing. And now I'm in what's called global configuration mode, where I can do things like configure an interface. Let's say interface uh, Ethernet 0. Uh, let me see here. Let's see what interfaces I have. Interface fast Ethernet. So fast 0, 0. Interface fast zero zero and then I can configure the IP address on there for example a lot of things I can configure on this Ethernet interface or fast Ethernet interface and again this is just the the CLI once I configure this in the command line interface on this router I probably want to go through and save my configuration so I'll exit to get back and I can say I want to copy I want to copy the running configuration, which is in memory, to the startup configuration, which is in flash memory. So that is the configuring of a router through a console access, command line interface. This is the Cisco IOS we're looking at here. Now, if I don't want to use a console or a command line to configure my network device, I can use a graphical interface and I'm accessing this Cisco 2811 router using SSL TLS securely accessing this through a web-based tool and you can see here this is called the security device manager and I can see at the home page here I can see information about my router the model the available memory the flash capacity I can see the availability of features and this is a integrated services router so I can see you know it's the IPs turned on I've got a firewall feature a virtual private network VPN feature intrusion prevention system feature and I've got a network admission control feature and it shows me it's available but it's not enabled and I can see information down here on my configuration interfaces firewall policies, VPN, so lots of different services integrated into this one router. In the configuration area, this is where I go and choose to configure, for example, my interfaces, and I can see this device, for example, has two fast Ethernet interfaces, it's got two serial interfaces, and I've also configured some loopback interfaces. As I select the interface, 
which I've also described over here. You can see the status of the interface. Uh, information down here, uh, IP addressing, network address translation, uh, rule access rules, access control rules, policies for IPsec and application inspection and VPNs and quality of service, you can see what's been configured on an interface by interface basis. So one of the first things you'll do on your routing devices, for example, one of the first things, of course, you'll do is you'll configure your interfaces. And you can you got buttons to add interfaces and edit and delete interfaces, configurations, test your connections. So one of the first things you'll do is do that. Then probably you'll go and configure routing. You can see I can en enable RIP routing or OSPF routing or EIGRP dynamic routing. You might also configure right off the bat network address translation to translate a public IP address on the outside interface to a private IP addressing scheme on the inside interface. And you can use basic or advanced capabilities there. Advanced just simply says, you know what, you're probably going to have a DMZ out here with some public facing servers in it. Something else you'll probably configure early on in the process under the additional tasks is things like you know DHCP. Maybe you'll, you'll do some router access, create some user accounts on your particular device. Control how you're going to manage the device and your secure shell keys that you generate for secure access. Maybe you're going to configure the DHCP protocol or your DNS configuration. These are some of your most popular IP services. You might also configure AAA services, authentication, authorization, and accounting. This integrated device also provides capabilities for intrusion prevention services as well. I've got an intrusion prevention button. I can run a security audit on this device. I can perform a step-by-step -step security audit, or I can just do a one-step lockdown, which is in one fell swoop going to configure this entire security lockdown on this router. So uh, in addition to the home area and configuring, I can also go to the monitor area, and I can monitor many different aspects of this network device. I can the status of my interfaces, the status of my firewall, uh, the status of my virtual private networking, traffic status, network admission control status, uh, my logging, which is my syslog information. I've also got SDEE, another protocol that's used to create security logs, and the status of my intrusion prevention systems here. So three main areas, my home base, my configuration area, and my monitoring area. Configuring a network device, for example, a router, through the graphical interface. In Network Devices Part 1, we looked at a wide variety of different devices, talked about hubs and repeaters, looked at network interface cards that exist for different types of topologies, talked about modems, dial-up modems, DSL cable modems, bridges and wireless access points, layer 2 and layer 3 switches, and routers. Now, firewalls, I did not talk about this because I really shouldn't have put this on the list. This is going to be coming up in the next nugget, Network Devices Part 2. It's really a specialty appliance. We'll also talk about firewalls and security appliances as we get into security in later nuggets of this Network Plus series. And then, of course, we finished up looking at configuring a network device using the operating system's command line interface and a graphical user interface. I hope this CBT Nugget has been informative for you. I want to thank you for viewing.